All right, so here we are in Luke chapter 16. Very famous passage. I'm not going to be preaching so much on the latter part. Um, we use that a lot out soul winning, showing the reality of hell. But I am going to be preaching more on the first part. The first part, Jesus is telling a story unto his disciples about a rich man who was a steward. And he was failing at his stewardship. He wasn't doing his job right. And his boss basically comes to him and says, you know, confronts him about his failure. And he says, you know, you're going to lose your job. So he goes out real quick and he goes to people who owed his boss money. And he's like, okay, well, how much do you owe? And he's, he says, okay, just write a check real quick right now and, you know, pay this amount. You know, oh, you owe 100, give 80. You, owe, you know, and he, and he was just having them to give um, a small amount so that that way they can settle their debts with him and they, they appreciate what he's doing and he's making money for his Lord also. Now, I'm not going to get too much into detail about that because what, what I'm preaching on this morning is I want to teach you some biblical princi principles to manage your finances, to help you in your financial life. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I don't put very much of an emphasis on money at all for anything. However, money is important in our life. We use it on a daily basis. We need it to, to, to pay for our housing and our clothing and our food. So there is a place for money in our life, obviously. Now, I think it's no coincidence that in this chapter where he's talking about this unjust uh, steward being commended for his actions and talking about him being faithful in that which is least, it also brings up the fact of the, the rich man and Lazarus. Because the rich man is the one who ended up going to hell. So obviously our life is not all about money. It's not about the riches that we can attain. So don't get the wrong idea about what we're, you know, what we're coming away with the sermon or even the goal or the focus of the sermon. It's not so you can just have this a mass abundance of wealth. That's not why we're here. But we do need to take care of the things that God has given us. God has blessed us all individually with, with different blessings, you know, financially, and we need to make sure that we are using that properly and that we're not just wasting it and that we're not being unrighteous or unfaithful in what God has given to us. Now, many people here, I know like myself included, have a family that we need to, to, to take care of. So obviously, the, the bigger your family gets, the more important the finances become because as a man, I'm responsible for paying for all of my, for my wife and my children and for supporting them. But we're all responsible for ourselves, first of all, if you're not married, if you don't have a family, but then also for, for your spouse or what have you. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why we need to look at this. And I want to I want to start off quoting from Proverbs 13, 18. We're going to get into Luke 16 in just a second. Proverbs 13, 18 says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. God wants us first and foremost to follow his commandments. That is the... the, the the biggest important part of our life. So the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And he's referring to the food and the clothing and the other things that, um, that we might be distracted with in this life of needing to get. He says, no, no. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Make that the priority in your life, and everything else will be added unto you. That's why in Proverbs 13 it says, you know, poverty and shame is going to be to him that refuseth instruction. If you refuse the instruction of the Lord, it's only going to lead to your downfall. It's going to lead to you coming into poverty. It's going to lead to you being in shame because you've refused the instruction of God. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Now, I'm not saying that if you follow all of God's commandments, he's going to make you a multimillionaire. That is not what he's going to do. But he will take care of you. The Bible says that um, you know, I've been old and now I've been young and now I'm old and I've yet to see the righteous you know, begging bread. You know, the, the God's, the, those that follow God's instruction, you're not going to go hungry. You don't have to worry about that. God has promised to take care of you. But we need to seek him first. Now, let's get into the sermon a little bit for, in Luke 16. We're going to reread starting in verse number 8. The Bible says, And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. 
For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Look what it says in verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Now, I consider money to be that which is least. It's not that important. You know, it's not the focus of our lives. The most important things are following the word of God and doing what's right. But what it says here is that if you're faithful in that which is least, you show that you'll also be faithful in much. We need to be faithful with, with what is God has given to us. And if we're, being, if we're handling our finances faithfully and not being a big waster and not just, just you know, a lot of people, you know, for example, it, it, it mixes in with sin too. You know, a lot of people drink their money away or smoke their money away and do all these things. If you're not being faithful with that which is least, you can never expect to be blessed with anything more or given any, any more to be, um, to, to be over. It says, And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Verse number 11, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? We need to make sure that these little things we have under control. If you can't manage the small things, the things that aren't quite as important, how are you going to take care of the things that are very important? How are you going to manage the things in your life that really matter? Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. A good example would be, would be on the job. Okay. If my boss were to, were to ask me to just, I, I work in a, in a warehouse. Okay, and we send a lot of product out. There's a lot of product that gets packed and shipped and sent out. The least of the jobs that I can do is literally take a product off the shelf, put it in a box, tape it up, and, and send it out. But if I can't even perform that task, how is my boss going to be able to trust me to work on something that's maybe a little bit more important, something that, that, that requires more thinking and requires more skill if I can't handle the, the small tasks. And that's what the Bible's saying here. Look, if you can't be faithful over the little things, over the, the, uh, the, the mammon, the unrighteous mammon, who's going to commit to your trust the true riches? Now, the true riches isn't money. It's not the, the mammon of this world. So God's saying, look, show yourself faithful in the little things. Like being able to handle your finances and support yourself and support your family and you could continue on. Because when, when you get your finances, now look, you may never be completely comfortable. There's always going to be struggles in your life. There's always going to be things that you feel like, I don't have any money for this or for that. And that's fine. That's probably the way your whole life is going to be. But if you at least can, can get to the point to where you're not worried from day to day where your food is coming from, you know, obviously we're relying on God, but, but you get to a point to where you've, you've managed the mammon in your life to be able to not have to worry about it anymore. You could spend more time focusing on the things that truly matter. And that's what I'm going to try to help you to do this morning. So we're going to try to be faithful in that which is least. And like I said, this, this does not get preached very often because it's not um, the most important thing. But it is something that we need to have nailed down in our life. So the first and the biggest pitfall that we need to avoid is getting into debt and partaking in usury. The Bible talks a lot about both of these. So turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22. Getting into debt is probably the worst thing that can happen in your financial life. I'll read for you from Deuteronomy 15, verse 6. The Bible reads, For the Lord thy God blesseth thee, as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. 
This was God talking about the, the nation of Israel, saying, okay, you will be blessed, you will have abundance, and you'll be able to lend to other people, but I don't want you borrowing from them. You're going to be in charge. You know, you're going to be ruling and reigning, not being under their control. And in Proverbs 22, if you turn there, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. See, you basically, when you go into debt, when you borrow from someone, you have become under their control. You've, you've kind of gotten yourself into bondage to that person. Because now you can't just, whatever you, you earn and you make, you're going to have to pay that person back before you even get anything more for yourself. And um, where usury comes in, usury is, is basically when you charge interest on that. So you take somebody, and this is why this is so wicked. I'm completely against usury. And, you know, the credit card, it's commonplace in our society today. We have credit card companies and people offering credit, and there's always an interest rate. You know, on my home mortgage, there's an interest rate. On everything that you get, every credit card, you have interest rates. And what do they do? They charge you, because you just because you borrowed money from them. They're charging you even more. And usually people don't have to go into debt unless they come across you know some hardship or some problems in their life is usually what prompts a person ever to go into to debt to begin with now some people do it because we live in a culture where they're just really covetous and they just want more than they can afford and they want to get things and they fall into that trap and start borrowing from people. But what's so wicked about usury is that it keeps you down. It keeps you from ever being able to come back out of that debt hole that you've sunk into. And the more, when you have to continually pay back more and more and more than you ever borrowed, it takes that much longer to even get out of that, that hole that you've dug into. So you want to make sure that you don't ever get into this trap. Because once you get in, it's going to take you way longer than you thought to get out. And I can tell you this by experience. <laughs> I am not perfect when it comes to this subject. I have completely changed my ways, though, after, after learning about all of the, the, the problems with usury and debt. I have a lot of problems still from, from younger days that are, that are still with me today. And I'll tell you, you know, you work really hard and, if, and it feels like it could take forever before you're ever going to get out of this. Also, don't get yourself involved into, in debt and try not to, um, to go that route. And, a, you know, a big, a big way of staying away from this and avoiding this is by checking your covetousness and, and the things that you want. Why do you want to even buy, you know, why are you willing to go into debt? Is it for things like just to put food on your table? Or is it for a vehicle or some piece of jewelry or something else that, that really doesn't mean anything? That, that's, that's vain. Um, the Bible says in Exodus twenty two twenty five, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. So, what we ought to do in the church, now the credit card companies are going to do what they're going to do. They're wicked, okay? The banks are going to do what they do. If you have to, you know, every once in a while we come on hard times, and I get that. And sometimes you may feel the need that you have to borrow money from somebody to help get you out of a, a situation. If you, if anyone in the church, if, any, if you ever lend to somebody, do not collect interest on the money that you've lent them. That is wickedness. And the Bible says right there, if people come to you and you need to borrow from them and they need to borrow from you, don't charge them anymore. You could give them the money. And here, here's a good rule to follow too. If someone comes to you asking for money and you have the money to help them with, go ahead and give it to them. But don't expect it back. Now, if you're borrowing the money, you ought to be doing everything you can to repay that money that you borrowed. But if you're lending the money, give it away and be ready to just let it go away. Especially when it comes to people in the church because you don't want something like money to come in between your relationship with your brother or sister in Christ and to have that, that spoil the, the relationship that you have. If you're going to lend to someone, just, just feel like you're giving it to them. And if they give it back to you, great. 
And if they don't, hey, no skin off your back. But you never ought to collect interest on the money that you lend to people. You're in Proverbs 22. Turn over to Proverbs 23. The Bible mentions a few other things that can bring us to poverty. We're talking about finances this morning. So along with our finances, we want to make sure that, that we aren't doing things that are going to lead us to get into poverty. I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the sermon, but in Proverbs 23, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. And, you know, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. This is as true as the day is long. I, you know, anyone who goes out with us, when you go out soul winning, you'll notice the prevalence of the alcohol cans when we go into some of the poorer neighborhoods. Where, lately, we've been, we've been going soul winning in a, in a trailer park. And very receptive. And praise the Lord. You know, we're going to reach the poor. We're going to go to them first. We're going to bring the gospel of Christ to get them saved. But I'll tell you what, it's no surprise when we walk up to these places and you see the beer bottles and the beer cans just, just littered around their, their house. And it's just trashed. Why? Because the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. And that's one of the reasons why they're in the situation they're in to begin with is because they are feeding their flesh and they are not doing what's right according to the Bible. And they've brought this on themselves. And we don't want to bring this on ourselves, so we need to watch. Um, you know, definitely, I just stay away from alcohol together, but it also talks about gluttony, you know. Watch how much food you're eating. Don't let that become um, too much to... Your, your, your desire, your lust for your food become overwhelming to where you're just spending too much time and, and gaining weight and, and doing everything by um, being gluttonous because that will lead you to poverty also. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. <clears throat> Verse number 22. Proverbs 28, 22 reads, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. So this is talking about people who want to get rich quick. You want to make a fast, easy buck. Instead of putting in the hard work, instead of spending time and doing it right, people just looking to get the, the fast money. And again, you see this all the time. You go into a convenience store and you see the people buying all their scratch and win tickets, right? The vast majority of the people you see doing that already are poor. They don't have very much money. You don't see people who have, you know, own a business and have worked their way going out and buying these scratch tickets because they know that they're a waste of money because they know they're going to bring you to poverty. They know that the odds are against you. They know that, that, you know, just like with the casinos, you go out to Las Vegas and you see these massive structures, right? And all these great statues and these big buildings. Where do you think they got the money to pay for that stuff? They got it from the people who are going there trying to make a quick buck. The people that are, that are giving all their money away in the hopes of getting that fast money. That one in a million shot of, of getting rich. Instead of investing that same money that God has given to them, being faithful with that, and using that to slowly build upon to, to get to the point to where they're, they're more comfortable. But no, if you haste to be rich, the Bible says you're going to be brought to poverty. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. You're in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. This is a very, very important part of the sermon. And again, I don't touch on this a whole lot. I've preached sermons on this before. I do think it's important. This church is not all about money, but one of the most important things you can do to have your financial life in order is to tithe. I completely and strongly and firmly believe in tithing. I tithe myself. I have a full-time job. I make money and, and all of my increase. God gets the tenth part of what I earn. And I believe this is very important. And a lot of people will think, 
I don't have any money. What do you mean I need to give God 10%? I can't even afford to have this or that. Or, you know, I can't afford to pay my bills. How can I afford to tithe? Well, look, it's not affording to tithe. It belongs to God in the first place. It's His. We're just giving back to Him. But He makes a promise, though, also. This is not even something that, you know, God could demand it and require it because He's God. And he does do that. But he doesn't leave it at that. God gives us a promise and he promises a blessing if we can just humble ourselves and be obedient and learn to live with what he's given us and acknowledge that he has given us what we have. Look, everything that you have today is because God has been blessing you, because God has been good to you. Some may have more than others, but we need to recognize the good that we have in our life has come from God. God has given you the abilities that you have. God has given you the mind that you have. God has given you the hands that you've had. Whatever skills that you have to earn a living, God's given that unto you. It's only right that we recognize that and we give thanks to God for blessing us to whatever point we're at in our life today. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. Look at what he says in verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. He's saying if you do this, if you honor God first, and that's why he calls it the first fruits, don't put God last. When I get my paycheck every, week, every two weeks, the tithe is the very first thing that gets apportioned is saying, okay, this money is being spent. This is the tithe to God. Then comes my mortgage. Then comes, you know, electric bill. Then comes, other, you know, food, other things, whatever, whatever else needs to be paid. God comes first. He gets the first fruits of my increase. And he makes a promise. He says, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and presses shall burst out with new wine. He'll take care of you. He says, you, you honor me first. You see, I see that you're humble, that you're doing what I tell you to do. Guess what? I'll bless you for that. It may not make sense to you. Say, well, wait, how, how can I have more when I'm giving money away and, you know, it's just, it's just going to the church or going wherever? You have to take it by faith. It's because God said so. We have to trust that God will bless us. Malachi chapter 3. You can turn there if you like. Malachi chapter 3. We see some more promises and discussion about tithing. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. The Bible reads, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Now think about that. He's saying, is there anyone that's going to try to steal from God? Are you going to rob God? You ask somebody that, most of the time they'd be like, no way. I'm not that stupid. I wouldn't try to rob God. He says in this, in this verse, but you've robbed me. And they don't even realize it. They say, what do you mean we've robbed you? How have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You see, the tithe belongs to God. So when we don't give him the tithe, it's like we're robbing from him because it's his. Let's keep reading here. Verse number nine. He says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Again, we see that promise. He says, prove me. Test me right now. Test me by giving me the tithe. Give me the tenth of what you make. And just prove me and see if I won't open up heaven and pour out blessings upon you. He says in verse 11, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Look at those great blessings he's talking about. And it's all referring just to being faithful in giving your tithe. Giving tithes and offerings. Managing our finances, the first thing that you ought to be doing. And I don't care if you make, you know, $200 a month. 
You ought to be giving that $20 a month to God, to the church, to, to, to bring. It says here that, that, um, that there may be meat in mine house. You know, you may notice if you've been coming here for a while, everything that we do here is free. All of our literature, all of the, the everything we hand out, the DVDs, the events that we have, we have food, we have fellowship, we have, we have good times. It's all paid for by the church because it's all provided for through the tithes and the offerings. Now, we can obviously serve God without money. God doesn't need money in order for souls to be saved. God doesn't require money for us to sing praises unto Him. God, you know, God doesn't require money for, for me to stand up and preach and teach the Bible. But there's a lot of other things that we do that helps get the message out much further. And actually that, that helps people in need in the church. And I'm going to get, that's going to be the last point of my sermon, is where the church comes in for helping those in need. Because one of the reasons for the tithe and the money that comes in is to help out the fatherless and the widows and those that are in need that aren't able to support themselves. That's what the church is here for. We've gotten to a day and age where the government has taken the place of the church and provided all these welfare programs and, and social security and all these other things to, to try to take care of the people who the church was there to take care of. And the big problem with that is that when you come to church, you are giving God respect. You're going to learn something about the Lord. You're going to learn the right ways. When you go to the government, it has nothing to do with God. And that's where you see the, the decline in people getting stuck on welfare and not going out and working because, hey, the government's just going to provide it for you. When you come to church, there's other things involved. And we're going to get to that. I'm going I'm to explain that at the very end of my sermon, where some of the money goes where you help people from the church. But let's go back. We're going to switch gears from the tithing now. Let's go to Proverbs again. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Again, we're talking about managing our finances. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 6. Proverbs 6, 6, we're going to see God referring to an ant and how the ant works. Proverbs 6, 6, the Bible reads, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man." He's saying here, you know, look at the ant. The ant's not lazy. And, you know, that's what a sluggard is, someone who's lazy and not, get, not willing to get up early and put in hard work and put in a good day's work and, and just lays around and sleeping and taking naps. He's saying, look, if, you, if you're not going to get up and work, you can expect to come to poverty. But there's something else that I want to show you here. It references the ant, and it says, look, the ant doesn't have a guide. There's no one overseeing. There's no boss. There's no ruler telling him what to do, yet he still goes out and does this. You ought to be able to not have somebody always hanging over you, telling you, you need to go out and work hard. You ought to be able to, to, to go out and do it yourself. But it references here the harvest, right? It says, gathereth her food in the harvest. And of course, um, when do you harvest? It's, you think of a farmer, right? Someone who goes out and does farming. A farmer needs to have a plan on feeding their family throughout the year. Because when you sow crops in the field, you have a time of sowing, you have a time of, of working the land, and then everything has to grow, and then you finally harvest it, and you, and you reap quite a bit of food. But that food is going to have to last you throughout the whole year until the next harvest. So, based on how much harvest you bring in, you need to be able to ration your supply to be able to get you through the hard months, get you through the winter when nothing's growing, to be able to, to, to survive and feed your family 
through those times. So you may not be a farmer. You'd be like, well, what does this have to do with me? I'm not a farmer. But you have to do the same thing with your income. So one of the, a very smart thing that you ought to do if you have problems with your finances is create a budget where you're deciding where is all my money going to go to. You need to understand, you know, certain things come in. You, have, uh, you need to be able to prioritize what needs the money you come in. Now, most people have, understand or know how much money they're going to be receiving every couple weeks or every month or however you get paid. Most people are in that type of position. Not everybody, I understand that. But most people are. And you need to be able to look ahead to the future and be able to see, okay, this is how much money I'm making. We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to stay clothed. How much money is that going to require? And you start subtracting from there. Obviously, the first part is the tithe. You say, okay, well, God gets this much. And now we need to eat. Because if we can't eat, you're, you're not going to live, right? So you need to take out some money for food. And then you keep on going down the list that way to budget it, knowing what you have coming in. See, what you need to do is prevent yourself from spending more than you have. Because that's where it's going to lead you into debt and it's going to lead you down a downward spiral of, of being in bondage. But um, you need to prioritize by your need and not by your desires, not by the things that you want. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, it says, In having food and raiment, let us be there with content. We should be satisfied with just having food and clothing. And notice that verse doesn't even say anything about having a place to live. Jesus Christ said the Son of Man hath not a place to, you know, to lay his head. Jesus Christ didn't have anywhere to stay when he, was, when he was doing his ministry. But he had food and clothing. And that's what we need to be content with. Again, the, the, the society we live in today is very covetous and the, the, the TV ads and the, and the radio ads will try to get you to want more things and try to tell you why you need to have this, why you need to have that, why you need to own this new car, why you need to own... Whatever, the, whatever they're trying to sell you. But we need to be content with the things that we have. Verse number 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We need to be content with what we have and not worry about getting rich. But we do need to take care, be good stewards of what God has given us. So obviously we need food, we need clothing. That needs to be taken into consideration when you're performing your budget. But do you really need cable TV? Do you really need cell phones or that new car? I mean, think about all the things you could spend your money on and start asking yourself, do I really need this? Now, if, you're, if God has blessed you and you're making a, a good income and you can afford the, the luxury items, the things that are nice to have, great. There's nothing wrong with that. If you can afford the, you know, the fancy new cell phone that's got all the toys and gadgets on it, whatever. Look, if, if, that, if that's not impacting your family being fed and being clothed, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But... Don't get so excited over these things and these toys and these gadgets to where you're spending the money on that before you're even spending the money on your food or your health and, and the things that are really important. Now, in order to stick to a budget, it's going to require willpower. It's going to require a lot of effort. It's not an easy thing to do, but I'll tell you right now, it's the wise thing to do. A lot of us have a tendency to act on impulse. And you see something, you want it, you got a little bit of cash in your pocket and you buy it without even thinking ahead of, oh wait, I'm not going to get paid again for two more weeks. Now what am I going to do? And you've gotten yourself stuck. The Bible says in Luke 14, uh, verse 28, it says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether you have sufficient to finish it? And I think what we can learn from that was, is, um, you know, if you want to make a large purchase. Now, obviously, Jesus Christ was talking about something else. Um, 
but it's still a reality. He says, look, if you're intending to build a tower, don't you sit down first and count how much it's going to cost before you even get started on the project? Now, if we're going to be spending money on things like, like this is talking about a tower, but let's say a big purchase in your life, uh, maybe a vehicle, right? Maybe you want to you buy a new car and you're going to plan for it and you're going to budget for it, you're going to save up money. You have, to, you have to be able to realize that and consider all of the costs involved. So a lot of times what people do is they'll take everything that they have and try to get the absolute best vehicle they could have and then they don't consider costs like maintenance. You know, things that, that you, when, you have to, when a car breaks down, you have to replace it. Oh, how much is that going to cost? And just the fuel and oil changes and everything else that goes along with it. You need to be able to plan accordingly with everything that you get. My wife is, is, likes going out on the lake and, you know, her father has a, has a boat and it's a lot of fun. But um, she says, you know, why don't, why don't we get a boat? And it's like, maybe one day we will. But don't forget that if we get something like that, well, we're, first of all, we're going to need to be able to buy a truck in order to pull it wherever we want to go. We're going to need to be able to pay for the gas and the storage and, the, you know, and, and everything else that goes along with it. There's time involved with it, keeping up with that. Look, there's a lot more to it. Don't just act impulsively and just say, oh, I want this. This is so much fun. I'm going to go out and get it. And then you're stuck with it and it becomes more of a burden and a hassle than you realized. So... Every, when you're dealing with your finances, one of the best things you can do is, is take a step back and, and really um, figure out what, <laughs> everything that's involved, especially with a big purchase, but even with the, with the little things. Make sure you're accounting for all of the money that you're putting out there. Now, um, let's see, we're almost done. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Like I said, this is not the most exciting sermon, but there's just a lot of wisdom from the Bible that we can learn about dealing with the, the small things, dealing with the money. I, I, I would hate to see people come here um, in poverty and just, and just completely in want and in need when there are simple things that we can change about our lives to where that won't happen and where we could be more responsible. Now, there's times when even the hard workers will fall on hard times. Maybe something happens and, and your health goes really bad. You know, something unforeseen. You have an accident and maybe you break a leg or break an arm and now you're not able to work. I understand these things happen to people and there are legitimate needs and reasons that you might need help from somebody. It happens. It happens to the best people. And that is where the church is here to help people to get through those times. The church will be here to support you when you go through those tough times. However, I want to explain a few things when it comes to the help provided by the church. Because the church isn't just an ATM that's here to pull money out every time you want something or every time you think you need something. The church is here to help, one, teach you how to get your, your own finances in order and get yourself on your feet. You know, the, uh, it's not a Bible quote or anything, but there is a little bit of wisdom to it. It says, you know, give a man a fish and you can feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish and he can be fed for a lifetime. So what we do in church is we try to teach you these, these basic principles on how to manage yourself so that you won't find yourself in need, hopefully very often at all. But when it comes to the church, there's a few things that are real easy. See, most of you don't realize this, but as a pastor, you know, I receive phone calls. We receive phone calls a lot from people just looking for money, looking for handouts. And sometimes people think I'm mean when I turn people away. But... Like I said, you have to understand there's, there's people out there, first of all, that they try to just take advantage of churches because they think that, you know, oh, they're going to be real caring or give money out. A lot of people are very deceptive. 
and they just want to earn a quick buck and they think they could just just hit up a church and, and just get money that way. Other people have serious problems like they're alcoholics. And I'll tell you one thing that we're, we'll never give money out as a church to just, just hand over cash to an alcoholic. They may be homeless, but if it's a result of their sin, look, they need to get that right. Now, we're here to help them, to help them overcome that sin, to help them get out of that. And, you know, I'll even... You know, personally, if there's, a, if there's an alcoholic out there that's, that's really hungry, I'm not going to give them cash because I don't want them going to buy booze, but I may get them a meal. Okay, We'll do things that are truly going to help people, but we're not here just to, just to hand out money and, and just call that charity. Because oftentimes what you're doing is you're enabling them and making their problems even worse. If I were to give, you could say, oh yeah, but this guy's homeless. He doesn't have any money. He needs some money to, to, to help him out. If he's got a drug problem or an alcohol problem, that money's not going to help him. We need to fix the problems, the real problems. And that's, that's what we do here at church is try to help people fix the real problem. See, people call me sometimes. I'll say, look, money's not your problem. When people come asking for money, I ask, well, hey, where did you go to church last Sunday? They'll say, oh, I didn't go to church. Well, look, money's not your problem. You need to be, I could give you all of the money. It's not going to do you any good. You need to get yourself in church. You need to get yourself right with God. Follow God and, and follow his righteousness. And then those things will be added unto you. The th your needs will be met, I promise you. But you have to come and seek God first. And that is what we do here. And that's the whole point, you know, when it comes to church and church giving. Now, you know, there's also instances where maybe someone, I've had this happen before too, where people, they say, oh, I've got a job starting next week, but we need a place to stay. And it's a, a, a man and a woman who aren't married. And they're living in fornication or adultery. I don't know. But we're not going to give money to support somebody else's sin. And to say, oh, okay, here, you can stay together and continue sinning. Look, how do you know that that's not God's judgment upon them for living a wicked life? I'm not going to try to help somebody if God's judging them for, for doing the wrong thing. Now, look, I'll try to teach them and show them and help them and say, hey, look, you guys, you know, you need a little bit of help. I understand you're down. You need to be living separate as of right now. You cannot be living in fornication. We, we, we cannot condone of that. I'm not going to condone of these major sins. Now, look, I know we're all sinners, and if you look close enough at somebody's life, you're going to find something that they're doing that's wrong. But I'm talking about major sins. I mean, adultery is a big deal. Fornication is a big deal. Okay, these, you know, being a drunk, that's a big deal. These are reasons that are given in the Bible to disfellowship from other Christians. They're serious sins. It's not just some minor sin. It's a big deal. And we will not support that in any way. Now, however, we will try to help people overcome those things. But money is not the answer for those. Now, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to see what the Bible talks about with widows. Which these principles can all be derived from here and, and others as well. But 1 Timothy chapter 5 actually spells out for us where the church's place is in taking care of widows. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 3. The Bible reads, Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable for God, before God. So the Bible's saying, first of all, if there's a widow... Now look, a widow, you think of, especially a widow woman, right? A widow woman that, that can't go out in the workforce, her husband's dead, he was pr providing for her. Now he's gone. She needs to be taken care of. But he's saying, okay, first step, the first thing, if that widow has children or nephews, it's their job to take care of that person. It's your family's job first. Your immediate family, you know, your, 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 your aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, you know, when, when someone falls into that situation, your family needs to pull together and help that person out. That is the first line. That is, that is the first source of help. 
Now verse 5 continues, though, because not everyone's in that situation. He's saying, okay, first do that. Verse 5, now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, meaning they don't have anybody, trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. So this is talking about someone who is keeping God first. A widow who is serving the Lord and not just living in pleasures. So a widow who's out just living in pleasures, buying their cigarettes and booze and everything else, the church isn't going to support that person. And, you know, a lot of people, you have compassion for someone. You might look at someone and be like, wow, you're in a bad situation. And you could empathize with that person. But it doesn't mean that it's, that it's the church's responsibility to, to, to pay for that needs and to take care for that person. Let's keep reading. Verse number uh, 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So God puts a serious charge here on the person of taking care of your family. He's saying if, if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. You're worse than them. If you're a believer and you don't take care of your family when they're in need, you're worse than an infidel. Look at verse number 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. So the first requirement says they need to at least be 60 years old. That's one of the requirements for the church taking care of, the, of a widow. Having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So we're talking about a good woman who loves the Lord, who helps other people out, who is a widow now, and she's over the age of 60 because now it's going to be a lot harder for her to, to work or to do anything to provide for herself. Look at verse 11. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So he's saying, you know, the church is here to take care of the old widows, but there's a lot of stipulations. There's, they need to be older. They need to be doing the good works. They need to be, you know, fitting everything laid out here. And then, yeah, the church is going to take care of those people. Absolutely. Jump down to verse 16. Verse 16 says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So the church is supposed to help people when there's no family, when, they're, when they love the Lord, they're serving God, and they're, they're older. That is what the Bible outlines. Now, a lot of people have this view that the church is there just to help every single person out. When you come and have a problem, to, to, to go to the church and they'll provide the money for you. And it's, that's not the way it is. The church has a lot of, a lot of um, uses for the, for the money that comes in, right? It's not just welfare in the sense of, of giving money away anytime someone asks for it. There have to be good reasons. And that's, you know, one of the good things about the church providing help to people as opposed to the government is that the church can really get involved individually with a person and if someone truly is in need and they don't have the government or someone else to fall back on they'll be willing to make the changes necessary in their life in order to receive that help they'll be willing to see God and say well if this is the place I'm gonna find it then I'll come in, I'll come to church, I'll try doing things your way if you're going to help me out. And we will do that. I will, we, this church will help people out. But you have to be willing at the very least. You know, people call up, they want to come down to the building on an off day and just pick up some money so that they could go get food. Come to church. Go to church. If you tell me you went to another church, hey, let me know that you're trying to seek God first. And if not, I'll tell you, hey, come to church. Don't expect, though, just to show up. Look, everybody here works hard for their money. I know that I do. And when I give money to God, I give it because, I, because it belongs to Him. 
But we are going to be good stewards of what God has given us here also. We're not just going to waste it and just, and just give it out to every single person that ever you know, calls up on the phone asking for the free handout. We will try to help people as much as possible. That's why we're here. We're here to help people and to reach people, reach the lost and reach the community and, and be a, a true help for them. But it's not all about the money. The money will be used as necessary. If money is needful for somebody, if it's a true need, the church is here to help with that. But the money is also used for other things. It's used for the Bibles that we give out to people. It's used for, for, for other uh, sources of evangelism. But, um, you know, hopefully you've learned something today. I know it's not the most exciting sermon. This is probably one of the most benign sermons. But um, it is important. Let's learn to be faithful over that which is little. Let's take care of these little things and, and make sure that we can show that, that we can handle our, our financial life. And once God sees that, okay, yeah, you're able to take care of your finances, I'm going to start giving you the greater riches and, and putting you in charge of more things that are worth a lot more, that are more valuable since you're able to take care of the small things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the wisdom that we can learn from your word. God, I pray that you would please help us not to be focused on money, not to, to be a, a major uh, focus in our life, that we would avoid the, the trap of wanting to be rich, dear Lord. It's not about being rich. I pray that you would please just help us to be wise with the things that you have given unto us, that we don't become wasters and that we don't um, fall into poverty, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just sustain us with, uh, with food and clothing and help us to be content therewith. And Lord, help us to be able to do well to others and, uh, and to help other people in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.